Ellie. Yeah, Ellie, if you could get started, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Allie. Um, can you all hear me okay? Sure. Good. Okay. Um, I am an art historian and an artist, and uh, I'm on the exhibition committee for the Jewish Art Salon. Um, I'm really excited that you're all here for today's session. Um, so before we get started, I just want to make sure that everybody has themselves muted. Um, like I was joking at the beginning, um, I, I do also have muting powder just to make sure that um, uh, we can hear the presenters well. Um, and that icon is found uh, most likely at the bottom left of your screen. It looks like a little microphone. Um, if you're not muted, it'll say mute. Um, if you are muted, it'll say unmute. Um, except, of course, the presenters are kibbutz and the Jada Arts folk. Um, so how to view this session? Um, so Bye, boo -boo. you should be able to see um, everybody, but at the top right. Oh, hi, Grandma. Oh, hi, Boo Boo. I love there you. There should be an option. Ellie, ask Rosemary to mute herself. There should be an option. Um, it'll say speaker view or some or other things. Um, it's preferable to see it in speaker view just to make sure that you can see everybody's presentations. Um, but then when we get to the question and answer, you might want to play with that um, and change it to gallery view so that you can see everybody. Um, this session is a collaboration between J the Jewish Art Salon and Art Kibbutz and Jada Arts. The Jewish Art Salon is a global group of artists and scholars. We organize art exhibi exhibitions and other art events, and we help promote our members and provide resources. Um, so now I'll call on Esther Margit, who can introduce uh, Art Kibbutz. Is Esther here? Good morning from Florida. Good afternoon. Rosemary, can you please mute yourself? We're trying to uh, do the first part of the session uh, muted for everybody. I'll mute it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't see Esther here yet. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Jonatas, would you like to introduce Jada? Welcoming me here uh, today. It's wonderful. Uh, Jada is a metamodern arts organization. It was founded just a few years ago under the brand of the Wandering Masters Art Salon, which has been around for about five years now. Uh, we have partnered with uh, the Jewish Art Salon before, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Our main goal is to make sure we uh, uh, engage in grassroots uh, uh, movements. Uh, we are artist-led and uh, we promote uh, artist residencies, uh, art fairs, art exhibits, and collaborations within the art world here in Miami, in uh, New York, and now in Paris very soon, God willing. Great, thank you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Yona Verwer. She's the co-founder and director of the Jewish Art Salon. Hi everybody, welcome to this session. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting our two presenters in Jerusalem in 2015. That was the first time that the Jewish Art Salon had an exhibition there at the Jerusalem Biennale. Um, born in New York City, Judy Cardozo, independent curator and writer, educated at Pratt Institute and Barnard College, worked at the National Foundation for Jewish Culture, and curated exhibitions at the Bronx Museum, Yeshiva University Museum and the Bertha Rudan Gallery. In Toronto, she was curator of the Beth Sedek Museum and co-produced the Ashkenaz Festival at Harbor Front. In Israel since 2000, she worked at the Center for Jewish Art and has been involved with the Jerusalem Biennale, where, by the way, she helped the Jewish Art Salon very much two years ago in 2017 when we were at the venue that she was um, managing. Dr. Susan Nashman Fryman is a lecturer, researcher, and curator of Jewish and Israeli art. She has taught at Hebrew College in Newton, Massachusetts, the Pardis Institute of Jewish Studies, and currently teaches at the Rothberg School for Overseas Students. She served for five years as the collection manager at the Yad Vashem Art Museum and curated the exhibition, The Fine Line, in the 2015 Jerusalem Biennale. Her website is 
www.artinisrael.net. Thank you so much, both of you, for presenting. Please take it away. Okay. 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 I'm going to share screen. Screen with everybody. Okay. You can see? Does everybody see? Anyway, I would like to officially welcome all of you um, to Jerusalem, which is where Susan and I are located. And it's a beautiful night here in Jerusalem. And this is a very special city, clearly. And it's clearly the city of the center of the Jewish imagination and has been since ancient times. Um, I just thought I'd add that Susan and I, in addition to being very uh, old time residents of this beautiful city, Jerusalem are native New Yorkers, very proud native New Yorkers. Um, and it's a real pleasure to reach out to some of you who are in New York um, and share some thoughts um, about an exhibition that we curated together as part of the fourth uh, Jerusalem Biennale. And thanks to Zoom, we will try as best as we can without any too many glitches um, to give you some background on the ideas that set the inf this invitational exhibition into motion and walk you through the exhibition itself. And we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for, for questions. First, a few words about the Jerusalem Biennale. Um, like other cities around the globe, Jerusalem felt that it was time that it take its rightful place as a cutting edge city, um, that it deserved a place in the cultural map of the world. And in 2013, um, Rami Ozeri established the first Jerusalem Biennale. And now it's heading into its fifth iteration and it's become a major biannual event here in multiple venues all around the city. And as you can see here, this past Biennale, there were exhibitions in all these amazing venues, um, notably the Van Leer Institute, the Bagan Center, and the historic YMCA, which is a, a building that was designed by the same architect as designed the Empire State Building. Um, there was an amazing installation and performance in a, an empty swimming pool in the YMCA. It was, a, it was an installation by Marina Abramovic. Um, and it was quite, quite something for Jerusalem to be able to host this international conceptual artist. Um, our exhibition um, was assigned to an incredible venue. Um, we were at the Kol Ha'ot Gallery in Chutzor Yotzer. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in Jerusalem, but Chutzor Yotzer is a beautiful artist colony that's built across from Yaffa Gate. Um, and in the, it was built in the aftermath of the Six Day War and the reunification of, of Jerusalem. Kol Ha'ot is a beautiful gallery space an activity center, which tries to utilize visual and performance art to explore Jewish values and texts and history. And I have to say for, for Susan and myself, it, a better shidduch we could not have found uh, in terms of venues. Um, first, from the outset, just to give you some background on the exhibition. The exhibition was somewhat speculative uh, and experimental in that it sought a visual response, mostly from designers, but later on, as you see, I included artists, to a very unusual story. It's an unusual story, a special story from the Talmud. It's a canonical story from the Talmud. Now, as an aside, over the years, I've seen a lot of Jewish art, and I have very, very strong feelings that too many creative people who are part of the Jewish creative world limit themselves to the same repertoire of symbols and concepts that for me have been emptied of meaning and feeling and they've been overused. And I understand that Jewish culture doesn't necessarily bring to the table that many visual manifestations, but it has incredible literary depth. 
And I thought to rectify this by exposing designers and artists to one small item into what we refer to as the Sea of Talmud. Okay, first let's define some terms. What is the Talmud? Um, in front of you, you see a standard um, page of Talmud from the classic Vilna edition of the Talmud. Um, now, ever since we became a people, after we were liberated from slavery, the core event in our life as a people had, was the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Everything blossomed from that point. Um, from there, we began our intense love affair with this, this incredible legacy. Um, and as we move through history, the word Torah expanded to include the oral law because it was transmitted orally. And these back and forth discussions of sages was finally codified, written down in the second century as the Mishnah. And then over a period of 300 years, the Mishnah was in turn commented upon by sages of those times. And those discussions were ultimately compiled as the Talmud in the fourth century and the fifth century. In turn, medieval rabbis also entered into this conversation and offered their opinions. All of these opinions that cross time and geography, all of these opinions, all of these voices find themselves together on the pages of the Talmud. It's these 63 tra tractates from those times that continue to be delved in and studied by countless Jews all over the globe, day after day, century after century. As you can see here, a Ponovich yeshiva, a very famous yeshiva. And in the next photograph, you see that the world of Talmud learning has opened up to both men and women in this last generation. Okay, I chose a famous story uh, or a sugya from the Talmud called the Oven of Achnai. Some of you may know this story, some of you may not know the story. I chose this particular story before I tell it to you because what began as a dispute about the status of an oven ends up being much, much more than that. It becomes a dispute about the place of humanity vis-a-vis -vis God. It addresses in extraordinary, dramatic terms, our relationship with the ultimate creator and our struggle to find our place as partners in creation. The title of the exhibition was Not in Heaven. And that title comes from a very dramatic moment in the story when the acting head of the Sanhedrin, which was the supreme, uh, Decide, deciding body of the Jewish people, that when the Sanhedrin tells a bat kol, a miraculous voice from heaven, you have your place, we have ours. Lo he, it is not in heaven, meaning the law doesn't reside in heaven anymore. This is no longer in your jurisdiction. The Torah has been revealed and we have received it and we lovingly engage with it. It's ours now. And this, this confrontation encapsulates a very seismic moment in Jewish history from a time when we were a religion where, which was directed and enhanced by prophecy to the world as we know it, which is a world where mankind has the job of determining and figuring things out and uncovering meaning on our own. And this struck me that this particular confrontation that you will hear more about perfectly describes the ongoing dilemma of us as human beings, and particularly artists, creative human beings, that day after day we come to our drawing boards and our easels and our computers, and we engage the world in, and what happens in it by investigating it, by butting heads against the nature of materials, what they can do, what, what their limits are. And we are enacting an ongoing dialogue with nature and, and the world. Um, we are very fortunate, as I said when I showed you the uh, co-ed of Beit Midrash, we are very fortunate in our time to be living in an era when we have access to the creative DNA of the Talmud. Once upon a time, 
if you didn't speak Aramaic and you didn't know the rules of the game, there was no way that you could actually study the Talmud. And it was kept in, in a community of people who were well versed in those things. And basically it locked out most people from that study. Um, the, ta the Talmud now has entered into the domain of the average person, whatever language he speaks, it's been translated. Um, and Vidalia Gerfine, who is gonna be pictured on the next slide, okay, um, who's a high-tech high entrepreneur and a rabbi and a Talmud scholar, basically was helping people at the exhibition um, use his, his creation, which is called the People's Talmud. And it's his brainchild, and it is an amazing work of creativity, um, which basically, he describes it as a internet-based Talmudic exploratorium, which allows all English speakers the ability to dive in to the very bizarre and interesting sea of Talmud. And I encourage you to um, delve into the People's Talmud and peoplestalmud.com and explore to your heart's content. You'll be, you'll be completely delighted. Okay, let me share the Oven of Achnai story to the best of my ability, as I did with all of the artists who we, we invited into the exhibition. First of all, the story's time and place. At this point in the story, when the story occurs, the second temple has already been destroyed, it's 70 AD. And essentially that holy place in Jerusalem, which served as the site of a communion with God for a total of 700 years, was completely decimated. A third temple would have to wait until the days of the Messiah. The nation was stripped of its sovereignty, of the sacrificial temple rituals, and some Jews were already in exile and other Jews were going to be scattered to the four corners of the world. And a huge question hung in the balance. How were the Jewish people going to survive without the land of Israel, without the temple? How exactly would we connect to God? And it's only at this period that communal prayer began to be developed and codified. In all of Jewish history, I don't think there is a comparable crisis as this particular moment. From being a land-based people, from a temple and ritually, a ritual, temple ritual-based people, we became, through many trials, the people of the book. Okay, let me set the scene. Um, okay, the scene is the great Sanhedrin, which is the high court and legislative body of the Jewish people. It's in session. It has had to move from Jerusalem to the city of Yavne, and the rabbis are assembled. And in front of them is brought an oven. It's an ad hoc oven made of circular layers of broken shards of ceramic and sand. And they're asked, the sages are asked, is this considered a vessel or not? And if it is, it carries with it all the laws of vessels, correct? Well, the majority of the sages say, even though this thing is a hodgepodge, it's a confused jumble of things. We still consider it a vessel. And that being the case, it's impure. It doesn't, it doesn't meet the standards of a vessel. We can't use it. Don't use it. Now, Rabbi Eliezer, who is called the great Rabbi Eliezer, who is the most senior member of the Sanhedrin of this time, is in the minority here. And he basically says this hodgepodge doesn't rank as a vegetable, as a vegetable, as a vessel. <laughs> and it doesn't need all the things required for purity. So yes, you can use it. And a terrible dispute erupts between Rabbi Eliezer on one side and his colleagues on the other. And this dispute becomes very heated and it's clear that this dispute is a lot more than about an oven. And actually the text signals this from the outset. In the opening text of the Talmud, this oven is called the Tanur Shal Achnai. And this literally translates as the oven of the snake. Achnai in Aramaic means snake. And it's pretty ominous foreshadowing. Because of its serpentine appearance, it's described as a snake oven because its coiled construction looks something like an achnai, like a snake. But the Talmud te text offers 
an incredible other reason for this name, which shows to me some amazing self-reflection. It's an Achnai oven because the arguments of the sages coiled tightly like a serpent around the figure of the great Rabbi Eliezer, unnecessarily shaming him and ultimately leading to tragic consequences, which you'll see in the, the story. Rabbi Eliezer, is, Rabbi Eliezer is the most senior member of the Sanhedrin. He's recognized as a genius who remembers all the teachings of his teachers, all the sages of temple times. And no matter how he tries, Rabbi Eliezer is unable to convince his colleagues that he's correct. And he's very frustrated. And he pulls out all the stops and he calls upon nature to back him up. First, he commands a carob tree to uproot itself and fly. And unmoved by this, his colleagues re respond to him saying, uprooted trees don't have a say in these matters. And perhaps what Rabbi El Eliezer is really saying here is, I remember how it was during temple times and I beg of you, young members of the Sanhedrin, don't uproot these foundations. And then next, for his next trick, he commands a stream to flow backwards. Again, unimpressed, his colleagues say, streams don't have a say in these matters. Maybe what Rabbi Eliezer is really saying is, time is rushing forward and I want to stop it. We have to look backward. We have to stop, look backward to the past, to know what to do now in this time of crisis. And then he commands the wall of the study hall to collapse. And like another tilting structure, they, walls do not collapse, they merely tilt. And they, the colleagues say, tilted walls don't have a say in the matter either. And maybe what Rabbi Eliezer is saying is, the temple, its physical walls and its rituals are gone. Is the house of Israel collapsing? Is it going to collapse? In a wonderful aside in the, in the Talmud, the Talmud adds that these walls are leaning until this day. And when it says to this day, I feel like this ancient text is speaking to us directly, to us in our day and tells us what we all, what we all know, that things are always in a state of near collapse, but that also is an invitation to us to enter. And it places everything in a very dynamic realm of potential and gives us the job of fixing and rectifying an often broken world. And finally, God enters the stage from above a divine voice, a bat kol, is heard supporting Rabbi Eliezer's position and says, basically, listen to Rabbi Eliezer. He's always right in these matters. And the head of the Sanhedrin has heard enough. He jumps to his feet and declares, it is not in heaven, quoting words from Devarim, from Deuteronomy. And another sage adds, since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai, we don't give regard to a divine voice. We follow the directive after a majority to incline. And basically this puts a decisive end to a debate that pits this great Rabbi Eliezer against all his colleagues. But the genuine tragedy is about to uncoil. Okay, Rabbi Eliezer won't budge. He won't accept the opinion of the majority. He's excommunicated. He's ostracized, his rulings are overturned, and his writings are, burn, are burned. And here enters one of the few women in the Talmud, and for a change she has a name, and she acts on her own volition. Her name is Ima Shalom. Here, as you see, it's, it's actually a name of a street here in Jerusalem, which means mother of peace. And Ima Shalom is Rabbi Eliezer's wife. She's also sister of the Nasi of the Sanhedrin that excommunicated her husband. And Ima Shalom, like her name tells us, is trying to keep the peace in this very complex situation. Now you recall that I spoke about the crisis of prayer taking the place of the ritual sacrifices in the temple. It's relevant now in the story, as the story comes to its climax. Ima Shalom comes from a very famous rabbinic family, the Gamliel family. And the Talmud text tells us that she learned something in her father's home that supplications, prayers of somebody who's been dealt with harshly, somebody who has been shamed, okay, those prayers will always cross the gates of heaven. And because of this knowledge that she has from her father's house, she fears 
that those prayers of her husband, who has been wronged and shamed, will cause her brother, the head of the Sanhedrin, to be struck down for his very harsh approach to her, to her husband. Ima Shalom are, is essentially alone with Rabbi Eliezer. They're in this kind of spiritual and social quarantine. And she focuses on protecting him as well as her brother by scrupulously watching him and being sure that he does not say those special supplications lest they have tragic consequences, but she fails. Rabbi Eliezer utters those prayers and sure enough, a shofar blast is heard announcing the death of her brother, the head of the Sanhedrin. Now, finally, the items in the exhibition. We tried to create a big tent for this invitational. Some of the artists were directly engaged with the story, the specific story, and some were very esoterically engaged with the story. And some traveled another road, meditating, for example, on the power and the standing of the book in Jewish culture, and others drawing on the Talmud page itself for inspiration. And all the responses were worthy and interesting and thought-provoking. I first approached designers exclusively because I know that many of them aren't only involved with the bread and butter work of designing ventilators and weaponry, but are interested in exploring the more speculative aspects of the physical world. And I was very interested in the kind of product that they would produce. So as you see, as time went on, um, you'll see coming up that in planning this exhibition, my vision expanded to include many other kinds of creators, not just designers. So after I approached these artists and we all learned the story of the oven of Achnai together, uh, the artists all found their own way, their own unique way into the story. Okay, here is a preparatory sketch for a piece called Ishim by an artist uh, designer, Luca Orr who's the head of the industrial design department at the Cholon Institute of Technology. And with the optimism that characterizes all of his work, and that's why I invited him, uh, he bypassed all the legalistic minutia of the story and focused on making something playful, on making a toy. The toy is made up of wooden blocks supported by a sm small brass figures. What he took from this very complex story was very simple. Everything ultimately depends on man. The weight of the world ultimately rests on his shoulders and all outcomes depend on him. Other artists, such as Yael Bookbind de Shimoni, found their way into this project through the graphic imprint of the Book of Talmud itself. She utilizes the frontispiece of the classic Vilna Talmud as a gateway through which she enters daily as a Talmud scholar herself into the internal world of the text. She uses it graphically in order to enter it as a visual artist. And as you can see, she renders this magnified frontispiece gate as, as something that's awash in tears, specifically the tears of Ima Shalom, the tears of Rabbi Eliezer's wife. And hovering over the gate, is an upside down tree, which is a reference to the carob tree, made of red cord, spreading its roots across the ceiling of the gallery, as if the roots of a tree can be anchored in heaven. They must take roots in the earth, she seems to be saying. They are not in heaven. And the, tr the tree's branches dip into a large old megaphone, which, bring to mind the, which brings to mind the batkol, filled with ink used in earthbound scribes to write and interpret the Torah. I now give my esteemed colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Susan Nashman, the floor to continue with a tour of the exhibition. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> uh, oh, here's another view, but yeah. We wanted to include, first of all, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I just wanna to echo what Judy said and welcome also to our artists, some of whom are listening in and participating tonight. Um, we wanted also to bring a work that looked actually like a painting, <laughs> that is a painting, uh, because most of our works are so uh, are more conceptual or more abstract. And we brought this work by Ruth Kestenbaum Bendav, who did the series in uh, 1999 of uh, where she confronts Talmudic texts 
uh, in different fashions. Here she took an actual page from the tractate of Yoma, which discusses by and large Yom Kippur, um, the Day of Atonement, but there's a discussion of how the cherubs looked over the ark. And in addition, they, the rabbis extrapolate from that, well, how did the ark look behind the curtain in the temple? And uh, the rabbis in their earthy way decided that it looked uh, like a woman's body protruding through the parochet, through the curtain that separated the holy from the holy of holies. And so actually what Ruth did in this painting, which is actually made out of four canvases, is gradually the text is erased and slowly emerges the body of a woman here on the left. And the, the painting is called Badim because the rabbis are talking about those fabrics that were, that it were between most people and the Holy of Holies. People, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Uh, interestingly enough, this is also a text where on the page, the medieval commentators uh, address questions about the art in, Ju in Judaism. So it's a very interesting text full of a lot of uh, interesting meaning. Uh, another uh, artist who uh, incorporated the text, the text in her work is Yael Serlin, who I'm happy to say, and I want to congratulate her because she just won a prize for as a young artist from the Ministry of Culture. Uh, this work uh, is done on a blackboard. And what Yael did is use the blackboard as a way to try to understand the, the Gemara, uh, try to work it out with erasing and writing and copying text. But what she also did was explore the image or the character of Rabbi Eliezer because he seemed so unyielding from the Gemara text that we just learned with Judy. So she brought other rabbinic texts which talk about his personality. For instance, these two texts from the Ethics of the Fathers, which you're all familiar with, uh, the most famous one, of course, that you might know is If I'm Not For Myself, Who, who, I'm, uh, who Am I For? This is the text about Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer says here, is a, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus is a plastern cistern which loses not a drop. He was someone who learned and never lost any of his knowledge. He retained everything he learned. Uh, and uh, Yael addresses that here. Here is the text in Hebrew and here is sort of a cistern or kind of a well that's plastered over. Uh, in addition, another text from Ethics of the Fathers following says, uh, Rabbi Yochanan says, which is the best way to view the world or to look at people? And Rabbi Eliezer said, look with a good eye. Uh, so you see there are other facets of his personality that we don't see from the one story that come out in other rabbinic texts and flesh out the story for us. Uh, another piece, a very uh, interesting piece was done by the ceramic artist Shlomit Bauman. Shlomit is a was born on kibbutz and she is currently the, in addition to being an artist, is also the curator of Beit Binyamini in Tel Aviv. What Shlomit did here, Shlomit's piece is very interesting because it can be read in many, in multiple ways, and that's the beauty of art, of course. She had made a ceramic megaphone from a, a kind of clay that only, that in, uh, exists in Israel and is basically, doesn't exist anymore. She has purchased all of it. Most ceramic artists in Israel actually don't use Israeli clay, it turns out. And this megaphone emits a light. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little film of it admitting the light, sort of randomly. Can everyone see that? Uh, and this light can either symbolize the divine voice, right? The megaphone is silent, right? Ceramic doesn't transmit noise. It's not a uh, conductor, right? Uh, so it's a voice that's a light, something divine. And one of the rabbis who came to talk at our panel saw it that way. Or is it a voice that cannot be heard and something very esoteric about it? Or is it a voice that's not meant to be heard? So there are many ways you could go with this work and I, I think it's uh, very captivating. Um, Arik Weiss is a graphic designer and designer and artist who comes from a religious background and he focused here on the actual structure of the Talmud page. But he took out the text, he just has the framework there and the text is on the floor, he calls it fragile, because perhaps what's written in the text is more fragile than we think, that the text is so codified, so solidified over the years, that maybe it's more flexible or maybe it needs changing. Uh, he take, took the same framework and he created these 3D printed buildings, these structures, and they are built all on the same footprint. He's used the Talmudic page to build, and here are details so you can see it better. Can you use, and, and uh, it's interesting, the Talmud teaches very much related to this, people who came to the exhibit. From the same page, you could make what uh, a villa with a swimming pool, 
a factory, a farm, or maybe a holy structure, a, uh, an altar. So he's taken this idea of the page of the Talmud, made it concretely into different things to show that maybe different ideas can be built from the same structure and uh, pass on that way. Judy. Um, when I came to architect and designer, Irita Beer, with this project, I knew, I knew about her quirky uh, Judaica ready-mades um, in a series that she calls Garage Judaica. And she made it very, very clear to me that she was secular, that she was Israeli, and that her approach was gonna be secular with no religious overlay at all. And I told her how thrilled I was with this because the point of this whole project was to, to, was to reveal that the Talmud belongs to all of us, to every, to every Jew. It's part of her legacy and it's an incredibly rich part of the legacy. And her secular take was gonna give the exhibition vitality, more vitality. So she collaborated with a friend of hers who's a reform rabbi called Rabbi Lila Vesid, and they studied the rules of formal reasoning that govern the game of learning Talmud interpretation, okay? And the Talmud text is literally opened up with these tools, okay, conceptually, intellectually, and these are essentially, prim uh, these are essentially principles of logic. And what Yuri Tabir did is to take these logical principles and make them into actual material objects. She borrowed, all, she borrowed from all kinds of found items, from the worlds of precision, uh, appropriating measuring and engineering tools to literally construct meaning. Um, in this example coming up, she used old spectacles uh, and she refit them to providing a nearsighted lens on one side and a farsighted lens on the other which playfully illustrates the logical principle of kal v'chomer, which literally means from light to heavy, inferring something from the minor to the major or a fortiori in Latin. And because of her do-it-yourself approach to these concepts, she calls this piece D-I-Y, as in do-it-yourself, but she spells out the letter Y as the word Y, W-H-Y. And this posing of questions and this asking of why is consistent with the spirit of the Talmud and her lighthearted and found object approach basically opens up a very refreshing uh, path to understanding the Talmud. And it's paved with curiosity and playfulness rather than piety and heaviness. Um, what I also wanted to say about her, her work is that these repurposed materials are in their second or third life cycles. And in a lot of ways, Jewish life in Israel is also undergoing a very interesting creative recycling of ideas. And it's giving refreshment to Jewish identity. And that's one of the reasons why I made a point of speaking to artists who really had no, no Jewish background. Okay. Uh, like the work of Arik Weiss, that you saw earlier, um, the use of cutting edge 3D technology helped ideas re that normally would have just stayed in the imagination to actually be realized in, in 3D. Uh, Maya Ben-David is a teacher in the master's program of industrial design in the Bezalel School. And like Irit, Maya made very clear to me that she was secular. And she insisted that she had absolutely no connection to Jewish texts whatsoever. But after we began discussing the sugya and the Talmud, she suddenly re recalled that yes, she had some connection to the Talmud once, a physical connection. As a child, her grandfather moved in with them and with him came a very formidable Jewish library. And she was very impressed with a set of oversized books, which were most likely tractates of Talmud. And she sensed that they contained some pretty heavy duty material, but she knew what she, what she could access was the fact that they were very heavy books and they were very useful for her, for her pressing of her beloved wildflower collection. So the connection between her 
these books and her love of the land of Israel set her on the journey to creating her response to the sugya. And in her research for this piece, she discovered that everything that we know about native Israeli flora and fauna are based on what is found and recorded in the Talmud. And in addition, she was very moved by the story of Rabbi Eliezer and was struck at how thorny character traits cause unnecessary pain in the world. So for her, evolved yet another connection, linking the Israeli thorn flower with the human characteristic of the Israeli. As we all know, the homegrown Israeli is often a very thorny creature. And Maya, acting as an accelerating force of nature, as a healing force, as a metamorphosing force, envisions and produced, produces a wildflower, an Israeli wildflower of the future, which that, that, that allows it to have the flower blossom without having thorns that injure. So this is her, this is her wish for the future. Okay, the notion of protection in the next slide also mobilized jewelry designer Anat Golan to create something speculative. Anat has always been interested in female heroines and here she's taken the female character whose name means mother of peace, um, who suddenly finds herself in the, midst, in the midst of a milchama, of a battle. Ima Shalom essentially places herself as a shield between her husband Rabbi Eliezer and the person responsible for his excommunication, namely her brother. And for Ima Shalom, Anat created a necklace to offer Ima Shalom a measure of protection. And utilizing the language of her craft, she fashioned a very large necklace made of silver chainmail. She explained that this material of medieval armor was once the exclusive domain of women, which is something I didn't know. And interesting, it's very interesting, the role of women in crafting protection for men. It's something to think about. Okay, the next artist is Beilu Feineru, who is a well-known international artist who endured the communist era in Romania and divides his time between Israel and Europe. And he's one of the first artists um, who, in Israel who actually opened up issues of exile identity and displacement uh, into the Israeli visual discourse. And he works in a very wide variety of ways. And I was very, very interested in his take on the oven of Achnai's story. And much to my surprise, he saw this particular sugya as one describing a broken relationship between the Shekhinah, the female aspect of God and man. And he wants to make an object that would enact some kind of a tikkun, some kind of a rectification. So he fashioned a wedding ring to bring God and his people back together. And in this stugya, as we, as we heard, they're, they're wrestling with the terms of their separation, of their exile, from one, one from the other. The wedding ring also alludes to the form of a snake. And it's inscribed, as you can see, loba shamayim he, it is not in heaven, in Hebrew, a phrase which very well expresses the complexity of our spiritual marriage contract with God and with the universe. Next slide is of Ruth Schreiber, Ruth Schreiber's pieces, two, two pieces from a series. Um, she's a Jerusalem-based artist who explores Jewish and feminist ideas in a wide variety of, of media. And for this project, she focused on the oven itself, which sets this whole sugya into motion. And for her, the oven is a female archetype of sorts, which houses, houses things, it houses life, which provides and produces sustenance like an oven does. Um, and it's an arena of transformation. And she decided to go back to her first love, ceramic, um, and melded some of the elements of the Achnai story into these ceramic meditations. And these are two of the series pictured here. Um, what we commonly refer to as the book has undergone significant changes over the centuries from clay tablets to the codex to the digital media. And now in, in our smartphones, we can have a library that once occupied a whole city block. 
And for this exhibition, uh, designers, uh, Neil Nenner, industrial designer Neil Nenner and, and uh, graphic designer Abichai Mizrahi uh, collaborated for the second time on a subject of the book. And we're known as the people of the book who value books and their contents above all else. Neil and Abichai refreshingly bypassed all the verbiage traditionally contained in books, forcing us to look beyond content. They fixated on the formal qualities and the choreography of utilizing a book. And in their collaboration, they've essentially disrupted the book, the archetype of the book, and have stripped it completely of the text of subject matter, revealing its stature as material and as a sculptural presence. Um, one of their pieces, wonderful yeah. piece here, um, is something called a rotating book, which rotates, as you can see. And if you, the sound were on, you could hear it rotating. <laughs> um, essentially, it takes the codex, uh, which is the bound book, as we know it, and returns it to its origins <laughs> as a circular scroll, but with a twist. This revolving action is also like the circular motion of a clock, which reminds us that inside of a book, notably a book like the Talmud, is sequestered in it movement and the passage of time. These pieces were absolutely, I, I would say that of, of, of all the pieces in the exhibition, I think these really brought the, the design element um, you know, in, 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 in a very, very beautiful way. Um, artist and designer uh, Dov Abramson is one of the artists that we invited who is actively um, a student of Judaism and of the Talmud. And in particular, he is inspired by a quote from the Talmud, which says that Rab Nachman says, chutzpah is a good thing, even when directed towards the heavens. And from our Achnai story, it's clear that the sages were very well acquainted with the notion of chutzpah. Um, they argue with miracles, they outrightly reject a heavenly voice, and they base their decision upon the authority of their own majority. And so Dove wanted to animate the heavens <laughs> by transforming the gallery's acoustic tiles into blocks, reminiscent of blocks of text of the Talmud page. And he wants us to look up, to draw our attention, Klape Shemaya, which is the title of the piece, towards heaven. And heaven plays a very, very central role in this Oven of Achnai story. It's at one hand, it's being silenced. And on the other hand, it meets out justice at the end of the story. Basically, the spirit of this, this installation piece is one that recognizes that often our connection to heaven is built upon the bedrock of chutzpah. And essentially what he's saying is that when its aims are noble, no piety is demanded. If it's, if it's false piety. So better chutzpah than false piety. Um, I share this belief um, that the spirit of audacity, even when it's directed towards the heavens, has nurtured a culture of dispute, which has kept the Jewish people alive, kicking and creating. Okay, uh, we were very glad to be part of an international ex initiative, which saw the construction of three identical cinder block structures in three cities representing critical coordinates in the artist's various exiles. Um, this is called, the project is called Makom, and it's an ongoing project of a conceptual artist, Joseph Sassoon Semach. He was born in Baghdad to the famous Kaduri family. His family moved to Jerusalem, from which he exiled himself, as he describes it, to the city of Amsterdam, where he cur currently lives and works. Um, his two meter, square block structures have been built in many locations. If we go back one slide, you can see it um, the, in the Stadelik Museum. Um, and essentially it kind of looks like a spaceship that landed from, I don't know where. Um, and in this particular uh, um, project, uh, there, was, there were um, cinder block structures, Macomb, in the Hermitage Square in, in Amsterdam in Baghdad in front of the synagogue of his late grandfather and in Jerusalem in our exhibition. Now, Makom literally means place. 
And it's also one of the names of God. And once the temple in Jerusalem was a makom, was a place inhabited by holiness. But when the temple was destroyed and we were exiled, the makom, i.e. God's presence, was to be found every place, every place we resided. And Joseph felt strongly that this makom structure was a metaphor for some kind of indwelling, a womb-like container, like an oven where things undergo a transformation. And he also connects its square form to the tefillin, which to him served as portable temples, portable makoms. Um, other motifs which recur all the time in his work over the last 25 years um, were incorporated here as a kind of a commentary on the makom. One was the chessboard, which was constructed on the, the page of the Talmud on which the oven of Achnai's story appears, and a plumb line that was suspended from the ceiling, which indicated the vertical, the upright, the authority of nature, the authority of the truth. Um, and hovering over Semach's makom are sculptor Michael Reeder's uh, internally lit brain clouds, as he calls them. And Michael is an artist who lives in Jerusalem, but is a native of Melbourne. And he's had an abiding interest in the tribal ways and spirituality of indigenous people in Australia. And the process of cloud formation uh, has always fascinated him, that water vapor rises and eventually circulates and falls as precipitation. And basically the whole idea of the circularity of life and the interconnectedness of life was something that, that has spoken to him. Um, he describes this, the existence of these clouds as a space between that zone between heaven and earth where thoughts, concepts, and ideas gather and rise up. And I now give the floor back to Susan for the last piece of the show. Yes, I'm very honored uh, to talk about this work by Ken uh, Goldman. Ken is a native of the United States, uh, was educated in the United States, and lives currently on Kibbutz Shluchot, an artist, designer. And uh, what I love about Ken's work is that not only they are serious and humorous at the same time. Uh, this one, Carry On, shows Ken. He does a lot of works with himself in the, in the works. Uh, carrying or on his back, physically carrying on his back, a set of Talmud that he received from his, uh, his late father, who had in turn received them from his father. And this is a, a heritage that Ken has inherited, right? This is his father's inheritance to him but it is a very heavy load. And it's a set, of course, of Talmud. It's a complete set of Talmud. And Ken is showing that he, he carries it on his back. It's not an easy thing to carry, right? And it's also the play on words of carry on, right? We want to carry on our tradition. And also carry on in the sense of the things that you take on the airplane that you don't want to get lost in case your luggage gets lost, right? It's both of those things at the same time, <laughs> excuse me, and others. So I think that this is a very fitting image for us to, uh, conclude our presentation. Um, we we ha can take some questions. We have time for a short, uh, for Dove's animation. Uh, also, we have a short animation that was done also by the Dove Abramson studio. Mm -hmm. um, um, before, before we say, before we, wait just a second, I'm now muted. I just want to say that I, I hope all of you embrace um, and receive some kind of inspiration from these heirlooms that are our heirlooms. And I think the, the, the greatest achievement of this exhibition was really opening up a discourse with artists um, and putting them in context with, with Jewish texts. And I, I think discourse, I mean, for all of you as artists know that, that it lies at the, heart, at the heart of all creativity that we don't necessarily seek closure or perfection or conflict resolution, but this is the spirit of the Talmud that keeps things open and engaged with the world in, in all its complexity. And I hope, I hope it serves as an inspiration to you in the future. So if we have time for the animation, that would be great. There's no sound in the animation. Here we have the oven. <laughs> And the eyes are all on the oven, deciding, analyzing.
Rabbi Eliezer calls upon the carob tree to rise up, to take its deep roots out of the ground and to fly above the heads of the sages. He then calls upon the stream to flow backwards. and asks for the walls of the study hall to fall, but they merely tilt. And they are leaning to this day. <laughs> A voice emerges from heaven and says, the lacha is according to Rabbi Eliezer. And Rabbi, the, the, the nasi, of the Sanhedrin says, it is not in heaven. What's interesting is that there's an aside in the Talmud story that I didn't include in my telling of the story, which would be worthwhile mentioning at this point, which is that um, it's asked, what was God doing during this dispute? And one rabbi confronts uh, Elijah the prophet and says, what was God doing? And Elijah the prophet reports that God was smiling and saying, Nitzchuni banai, Nitzchuni banai. My, my, my children have defeated me. Um, which shows that this, this dispute was something that, that God took pleasure in. <laughs> So, we, yes. yes, time for questions. Thank you and for joining us. My Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all joining us. And um, we can uh, take questions. Yeah. Uh, and also, I just want to mention um, that we published uh, a small catalog, which I can send as a PDF. As a PDF. So if you're interested, send a, an email to Yona and she'll send me an email with people's emails who are interested and I can send them to you. Great, thank you so much, Judy and Susan. This was fascinating and I love that you really broke it down into like small details for those of us who are not so familiar with the Talmud and how do you make the link um, between you know, what the artists were doing and the original text. I was also delighted to see that three Jewish Arts Law members are part of the show, Ken Goldman, Ruth Schreiber, and Ruth Bendov. And um, so yes, let's open it up to people um, to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, you need to unmute yourself first. Um, so people, go ahead, jump in. I, I'd like to comment, if I could. Can I, can I make a comment? My name is Rena Bannett. I live in Jerusalem. I saw the exhibit was every bit as beautiful and fascinating as you made it out to be. I also would like to say, though, that um, I think it's really important to look at who's writing this is, who's the narr narrator of this story. And so when they put the words Nitzhuni Banai into God's mouth, it's the rabbi's agenda that people will listen to the rabbis. And that's actually the final word on the final word. And it's really important that that comes in here as well, because without that, um, Rabbi Eliezer is crying out in vain. Rabbi Eliezer has a real grounded point of view that's necessary among all the other points of view that we find in the Talmud. And it's really important to recognize that even though the, the rabbis of the Talmud who are the minatrim, the winners in this debate, according to God, according to themselves, it's right. very necessary to recognize that Rabbi Eliezer and other people in the Talmud that don't agree with the rabbis are valid, relevant, and necessary for current and future lawmaking. So I just thought I'd add that to your final word because I think it's really important. I love what you have to say. Um, Thank you. Because, because I think that Rabbi Eliezer is clearly correct, but correctness doesn't matter as much 
as authority matters at this point in yes. Jewish history. And that you're completely and totally right that this, 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 this basically reinforces the authority of the rabbis who are going to have to take over from the prophets. Rabbi Eliezer yeah. wants to live in the past when there was revelation, when there was prophecy. And essentially now it's all the job of the majority, of the majority yeah. of the sages. So you're totally right. It definitely has a political agenda. <laughs> yes. And then when we take it into today's world where we have so many now, I mean, I noticed among the women who were your artists, you had, it, it seemed to me from my very biased point of view that you were pointing out the ones who did not have as strong a connection to Torah mm -hmm. and Talmud. Mm -hmm. Somebody like myself and many others here, Leah Rab and others have a very strong connection to Torah and Talmud. Mm -hmm. um, and might approach this very differently, but still being women who are finally given that approach might also have interesting points of view for this kind of piece as well. It's a very interesting story and it's a very interesting way of making art. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. Can I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but can I respond to this conversation? Sure. Where um, I just, Oh, okay. Um, I'm here. I'll stop my video. Um, but um, I'm a Jewish artist, and I've made work around this topic, and I'm specifically really interested in um, this story and this and the idea of that comes from it, and all the philosophy around it. And I've like read a few different because it can be interpreted in so many different ways. I don't think there's just one way of interpreting um, this story. And one way that I think is interesting that I don't know if it came up as much, or I'm curious to other people's thoughts on the topic of like, how far can it be stretched when it comes to the Torah is not in heaven? Like how much of it is within our hands as Jews who to be able to interpret what is Torah to us? Which is, which is not a little halakhic uh, interpretation, but approach, but artistically, I think about it from that angle. I, I think I, I, it's an open question. You know, I think, and I, and I have to say that, that as a result of what you're saying and the previous artist uh, were saying, I, I really would encourage you to be in touch with us if there are pieces that you're interested in creating um, in order to enlarge upon this exhibition. I mean, I would, I love, would love that. This, mm. I would love to see this exhibition have another, another permutation. Um, maybe artists, you know, I don't know whether, you know, we can, we can limit them to artists who are uh, more well-versed in the text or, I don't know, I would, love, I would love an assortment of artists, new artists' voices. Mm. Um, so how can, can um, me and other people who are interested get in contact? Uh, I will, I will leave with Yona my, my, uh, email information. So I encourage you, I would okay. love to see this thing blossom. If, if I, if I might, my comment, um, it's Richard McBee here in, well, I, I used to be in New York. Anyhow, I, first of all, congratulations to the curators and to your presentation. Simply, really, really wonderful. It makes me terribly sad I didn't see the exhibition in person. And it really deeply feels like this is the beginning of a, uh, what should be a much extended project. Mm -hmm. uh, we're living in an amazing age. First of all, the fact that all of us are able to communicate like this, even though it's because of a crisis. Uh, it has opened us up, both the Jewish Art Salon and you artists. And it's on mute, they can't hear it, right? It, uh, it is, I wish we had a piece of paper for me, but I said. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is really an opportunity to extend this notion. And the notion is simply that the Talmud is not only our inheritance, but it's our property. This is us. This is what, what makes us Jews. And while there are certainly plenty of people who say, well, I can't read Aramaic, I can't read Hebrew, it is widely, widely translated English, French, etc. We live in an amazing age in which this is really open pretty much to anybody who has only one thing, and that's curiosity. 
It is so open and it is so much out there and so ripe for art making and engaging in it in so many different levels. And just as your Israeli compatriots who say, well, I'm not religious, but they say, well, wait a minute, but this is mine. That's, that's of course, that's, and that's been going on for a while, but now is more and more possible. I would certainly hope this becomes the beginning of a number of exhibitions, uh, perhaps more, including also some more international artists, such as artists in the United States, but really it is, it's wide open, but thank you very much for really something that's simply in inspiring. Wow. Thank you. Can, can I make a comment too? Go for it. Okay, hi, Joel Solstein. Hi, Judith. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm Wonderful good. to see you. Um, I thought you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, you know, not a question yet, but what you did was something really extraordinary in that when you said about opening up the Talmud, um, many of your artists, when you said uh, some of the designers were not uh, religious, not believing, they used the form of the book, they used, say, formalism or the actual language of their discipline to have a dialogue with Talmudic discourse and Talmudic thought and what the Talmud means to us in history. Um, um, uh, the, the woman, um, I'm sorry, Leah's friend, I forgot her name, when she said about be mindful that the rabbis had an agenda. Rina, Rina. Rina. I'm sorry. Sorry. Rina Rina. Rina. Yeah, hi, Rina. Sorry, I forgot your name for a second. I think what's interesting about that, it's a very similar, if you think of the Talmud as a historical document written by specific people with certain powers, it's very similar to, say, the Constitution of the United States that was, you know, written in a time of slavery, but yet we use it now through interpretation. We open it up. So it's the document as written, and then, the, and they're saying this it's in our hands, which is an incredible thing. So it doesn't have to be the rabbis anymore. It can be individual artists, it can be the laymen, we're, because we're Jews, that's the answer. And if chutzpah is it, then we are it. You know, so I, I wanna compliment you again. Uh, yeah, I wanna just say something too. Uh, I don't know if you can hear, uh, Judy, it's Toby Khan. I was blown out of the water, not only because it was an amazing presentation, but I really love that you had every type of artist. It didn't feel like it was heavy in one direction. And I think designers very often, except for MAD, the museum in New York, where they have center stage, I thought it was so powerful and so beautiful that you had people coming from it from every different direction. Uh, it was breathtaking, just breathtaking. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Judith, I also just want to say, Zaku uh, Baruch, first of all, this is a... Uh, um, and uh, going uh, with, uh, uh, with what Toby just said, uh, the fact that this exhibit was interdisciplinary and multidimensional is uh, perhaps one of the best aspects of this exhibit. Yeah. I, I, it's just incredible. It, 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 it brought to mind uh, one of the marks of the Jew, which uh, Joel just touched on, which is uh, to keep on wrestling with ideas keep on deconstructing, which the Talmud is itself a document that shows that as the mark of the Jew. We, we wrestle with ideas. We don't want to let go of our tradition, yet we want to be free thinkers. So what you did there is just phenomenal. Thank you so much for breaking it down in such a beautiful way to all of us. Thank you. Well, everyone, Thank you so much for joining. Is there another other questions? Tamar? Uh, I was a little bit missing the size of the work that we, maybe they were and I have not seen it because visually it will help to my imagination to see it alive. Well, that's, 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 a, that's a very good point. And I suggest that you download the, um, Oh, I don't know whether the sizes are in the catalog. Susan, are the sizes in the catalog? No. No. <laughs> we didn't have size. We didn't have size. Next, next edition. Next, next time. Edition. Next time. <laughs> next time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next time. Because I think it makes difference when you visualize it like a tall or it is something like huge or the size of it anyway. I think the fact that you could see them in the, on the pedestals that they were and in the box, it really, if you look at it again, I don't think you can tell with every work, but you can see with the ceiling piece and you, with Dove Abrams, and you got a feeling in relationship to each other, but I hear what you're saying. 
yeah. I just I just want to I just want to thank uh, Judy and Susan uh, in the name of the artist. I don't know if it's okay if it's okay that I'm taking uh, that role. Uh, but here from uh, sitting in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem right now, I, it was a pleasure to participate in this exhibit. And uh, it started uh, with a small idea and it went into something that was much larger than I think any of us imagined. I mean, uh, it, was, it was amazing to be a part of it and you did a great job. Um, it, was really, it was really an amazing journey. So thank you very, very much, really. I only want to add something that it was really amazing representation and I never heard and I never would imagine that on Zoom I can <laughs> have the feeling and the inspiration. It, it was a huge inspiration for me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, ha I have something to say, if I may. Sure. So uh, I just want to um, say thank you too and also one thing that's always been important to me is the power of using art to communicate Judaism. And I think that what you've done and what people like Toby Khan and what we have done with Artist Beit Midrash in Teaneck, New Jersey, is to show the world and show other Jews who are not necessarily affiliated or, or themselves don't feel a connection to Judaism that through art, you can really form a very powerful connection between art and Judaism, what's important, in, and to, to convey new interpretations, fresh interpretations. So Jewish art and people who can promote it in this way is very powerful, very meaningful. Yeah. I, I just also want to say that I want to thank, again, the Jewish Art Salon for giving us this way of bringing the exhibit to life yet another time for those who couldn't come to Jerusalem to see it. Totally. And uh, also give the works, uh, right? Life is short, but art is long, right? So we want to put it and hopefully help our artists also promote their works. And actually two works from this show might be participating in a show in Germany. So. Uh, we, uh, we do want to spread the word and we're glad that uh, you gave us a chance to do so. So we really appreciate it. Yona and all you artists, uh, thank you. wherever you are, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. And, and I just thank want you to know that you broke all attendance records. At one point we had 98 people on the call. Oh <laughs> so thank you. Wow. I just want to take this moment to say a little something about next week's presenters. They are a conceptual artist from Jerusalem, Lenore Mizrahi Cohen, who recently re relocated to Israel, and an artist from Los Angeles, Hillel Smith. And they both have participated in last year's Jerusalem Biennale and were part of the Street Art Mural Project. <laughs> and Lenore will do a presentation, Art in the Time of Corona, where she'll give a taste of what the artist landscape was like in Jerusalem before and during the lockdown period, which I understand is now over. And she will discuss her recent work created during the crisis. Uh, and Hillel Smith's work is based in Los Angeles, involves blending ancestral Jewish text and ritual with contemporary and otherwise non-traditional media. For example, street art murals with biblical texts and a digitally animated Omer counter. In Rethinking Judaica with New Media, Hillel will present a few projects of his as well as other historical and modern examples to attempt to reframe what Judaica can be. So it sounds like he and she are sort of like taking off what you started, sort of doing something in a similar vein, like reinventing um, Judaic art. I, I hardly ever use the word Judaic, by the way. I, in, I think it has like a bad connotation in the United States, so I'm just going to call it Jewish art. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to remind people if they're interested, right now, 15 minutes ago, started a conversation on Zoom between a Jewish art school member, Meta Kupfermink, and the or organizer of the Jerusalem Biennale, uh, Rami Oziri. I sent that Zoom link in this morning's reminder to everybody if you wanted to uh, see that, but it will also be posted on YouTube at some point in case you can't make that one. So um, unless there are any other questions, I wanted to finish this by again, a very heartfelt thank you to both of you. This was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Laila Tov, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.